100 days of hardcore Minecraft as an orc hunter with the Create mod. That's right, I'm going to use Minecraft's newest tech mod, Create, to roleplay as a steampunk dwarf. I'm going to make some advanced weapons, tools, defenses, and of course, a gigantic automated potato farm. Technoblade would be proud. I'll have to defend myself and anyone I come across. Hint, hint, day 50 gets a little bit wild. And on top of that, every 10 days, a new different orc attack will test my create mod machines and orc hunting prowess. I'll need to survive the orcs and hide from them as long as I can until I find a way to use the create mod to stop the orcs for good. But on day one, none of that is on my mind. I spawn in the middle of a lavender field, my favorite flower, and this video is already starting to look up. But I don't want to just sit out here all day. As any good dwarf engineer would, I start looking for a new mountain home. And I'm in luck, because soon I see this massive snow-capped mountain, and I simply can't resist. Like a drunk college student sing a Taco Bell, I go rushing in. And I see a settlement out in the distance. Looks like there's a little campfire burning there. And I like s'mores, so let's go explore. But first, about this video sponsor, Drake and Sang Online. If you're wondering why this video took so long to get out, it's because I've been dealing with my crippling DSO addiction. Drake and Sang is an awesome free-to-play MMO with over 10 years of active development with millions of players, including me. You can go and download it on Steam for free or by clicking my link for free. Did I mention? It's for free. You can play as one of four unique classes, but obviously Spellweaver is the best, as you discover everything that Dracana has to offer solo or with your friends. Of course, I don't have any friends, but I've been loving playing it solo. And trust me, it is really easy to get addicted with hundreds of hours of content, quests, thousands of weapons, and items to build out your character. You can hop into PvP arenas and battle with other players, I don't because I'm a scaredy cat, but I do love doing the dungeons, the boss fights, and completing all of the challenges. There's always new content coming out, like Realm of the Fire Lord, their newest update, and the biggest update that Drakensang has ever had. There's tons of new quests, new maps, monsters, skills, and a whole lot more. Download Drakensang online today using my link down in the description and check out what the world of Dracana has to offer. Seriously though, if you've been wondering why these videos have taken so long, it's because I really need help from these new supporters like Drakensang. If you click the link down there and you try out Drakensang for free, then hopefully, maybe, the next video won't take three more months. Speaking of fighting a bunch of monsters, let's get back to those orcs. I run into this huge pre-made castle. That first settlement's gonna have to wait. I want to explore this bad boy first. I come across this front door with a little hand crank. Hmm, well, if this is some kind of trap, it's only day one, so here we go. Luckily, it's just the way to open the front door, and not a spike pit. And from that first villager's hmm, I can tell this is a friendly castle. First courtyard has a bunch of traders, and this castle turns out to be an awesome medieval-style village castle. And look at this mad lad. We've even got some guards here, keeping the villagers safe. Yeah, mom, not gonna lie to you guys. After seeing all of this, I'm pretty tempted to just make this place my new home. After all, a captain is pretty much a king, right? Spend the rest of today seeing all the great loot that's in this place and finding this nugget of experience. Well, if it's anything like a chicken nugget, I'm in. And speaking of delicious, next we find the king's chest and we grab our first diamond on day one. I then decide to read through the king's diary trying to find out who he has a crush on, but sadly, I don't see my name mentioned even once here. So basically, this is as good as toilet paper. Well, that's a little bit upsetting. But what's not upsetting is this cool meeting room on the second floor. So is this where we have our small council meetings? Or is this the room where we decide who will carry the one ring? I forget what franchise we're in. I get up to the very highest tower and take a look at the view. And I see that this beautiful mountain has a massive ravine right down the center of it. This will be the perfect place for our very first attempt at the Create mod. I see that there is a massive cave entrance in the side of the mountain. As much as I love this castle, and I do, I know that this is where I'll be heading to make my base. But just before the end of the day, I decide to go check out that first settlement that we saw with the campfire. Maybe this place has some diamonds too. But as I walk up to the front gate, I can see right away that there are some skulls stuck on spikes out front. But hey, maybe they're just decorating for Halloween? No, 
Pretty soon, I see that this is a battle camp. Skulls and spikes everywhere, and an orc sign on the wall out front. Then, this ugly little green dude pops his head up, and sadly, this is not Shrek. Enter the orcs. These guys are not your average mobs. They run fast, and they hit hard. I cannot take this fight right now, and I try to lose aggro, but this green boy is chasing me all the way back to the castle front door, and I almost get to the front courtyard when things go from funny to fatal. I get slapped down to two hearts, and I have no idea if they can kill our villagers or if they can climb ladders. I don't know anything, and I gotta be honest, I'm kind of panicking on day one. This map seed is too perfect, and I do not want to restart. I run into the library, where uh, I guess everyone's hiding, and I try to eat, and pretty soon, I try to sleep. At least I know they can't climb ladders. I hope. All of that was just day one. This is going to be a crazy playthrough. Okay, so no more orc camp. Let's find a place in the mountains to get our dwarf fortress started. So, like any other 100 day video, I get started. I make an iron sword from the loot that we got in the castle. And this is pretty good, because it turns out I'm going to need this. I even find a smaller cave right outside the castle. I'm going to make a quick stop in here and grab this water so that I can go down into the cave. I also find a little bit of coal, so I'm getting pretty lucky once again. And we make our very first torch. I do a little exploring, but sadly this cave is mid at best, and it doesn't go down into the bigger cave. So, just like Thanos, I guess I'm gonna have to do this myself. I drop my water to help me get up and down when I hear it. Yeah, I don't like that sound. Yep, called it. The mountain is infested with orc. Luckily, I made that sword, and I can spank these guys pretty quickly. These are goblins, which are lesser orcs, so they only need an iron sword to deal with them. Not a big threat. But when I say infested, I mean it. I spend the rest of the day hunting and killing them, but I'm using a lot of food, and if there's just too many of them at once, uh, eh. as beautiful as this cave structure is, I think I should try to get a little bit more prepared before I decide to make this my home. I dig my way out when, oh hey, well this cave looks familiar. Turns out I just dug a perfect pathway from the mountain cave all the way to the castle. And since I know this little side cave is shallow, and safe, what better place to put an early base setup? Now I know I spent a whole 200 days underground, but this cave is much more pleasant, and it's much less radioactive, so uh, that's nice. So I set up a quick little cobble wall here just to keep out the goblins, and I go out that night to try to get wood to make a door. And hey, while I'm out here, I find this jacaranda tree, which is one of the coolest biomes of plenty trees, so I make sure to chop it down and grab all of its saplings. Back in the cave, I have to admit, a man is feeling a little bit lonely, so I decide to craft myself up a hoe. And I've never seen a jacaranda door before, so I decide why not, and I craft one up. I know this is a humble cave to be sure, but keep this in mind, this is how the dwarf fortress begins. But truth be told, I'm not really that good at being humble, so I start to make our first doorway a little bit better. I had some plank strips running down, and I decide to cook up the cobblestone. We get this all set up, and, uh, <laughs> well, hey look, the good news is it can't get much uglier, so it can only go up from here, right? Day three, and the hoe isn't just for show. Hmm, my rhymes really blow. Am I a rapper? No. But I am a farmer, and I'm gonna get this land next to the castle walls seeded with some tomato seeds from Farmer's Delight, which I've never tried before. Also, we plant some onions, because we live stinky, die stinky, and then because we're desperate, the most boring crop in Minecraft, wheat. And finally, as I promised, the best crop, potatoes. But Captain, you said it would be an automated farm. Oh, sweet summer viewer of mine, you just wait. Now, unfortunately, no matter how much I yell at the crops, they aren't going to grow any faster. So in the meantime, let's go back to the big, beautiful cave. Sadly, gentlemen, we have to admit, when it comes to caves, size does matter. And in this giant boy, I think I saw a big phallic outcropping of diorite, which we're going to need to craft into andesite. This is the most basic and one of the most important resources in the create mod. And right now, I'm getting about ready to get started building. Back at base, we combine cobble and diorite to get andesite, but you guys already know about that. Now what you might not know is if you combine two andesite with two nuggets of iron, you get andesite alloy, or at least you do in the create mod. And we're going to need a lot of this alloy to make our first machine and really anything in the create world. The mechanical press. It doesn't make cold juices, so don't get too excited. We make another quick trip outside, and we grow some jacaranda trees, because look at them. 
so cool. We then get a log, we strip it, and we smash an andesite alloy right into its face, which makes an andesite casing. The next step on our steampunk journey. We just need to craft up a shaft, and then we can use a block of iron. Ah, not enough iron. Well, there's no way to engineer our way around that. On day four, we need to go out and find some more iron. And I head to a cave where I saw some from day one. We get a bit of iron, which is great, but even more exciting than that, we find this huge pocket of andesite. Now, if you think I'm just gonna leave any of this andesite behind without mining it all until my pick breaks, then you don't know the captain's CV. And on my way home, I see the castle all lit up at night. Truly beautiful, almost as beautiful as you, my loyal viewers. Back at base, I craft up another iron pick, but I see that there is a brass pick. Ooh. I look into how to make brass, and it doesn't seem like it's too hard, is what I thought at the time. So this will be the very first useful thing we make in the Create mod. First, we have enough iron to make that mechanical press. We're going to have to find out a way to get this thing running. And, um, well, let's just say we've got some work to do first. So we use a water shaft to make a large cogwheel and surround that with slabs to make a water wheel. This is a solid power source, and it's probably the first one you'll make in the Create mod. See, the Create mod doesn't just work on a reactor making a ton of RF. It's a little too hip for that. No, Create runs on kinetic energy through torque from things like a spinning water wheel. A bit low tech, but it has a more tangible and a more achievable feel to it. Think about it. Could one guy in Minecraft make a whole nuclear reactor? Probably not. But a water wheel that powers a primitive press? Yeah, much more realistic. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing in our very first machine. I added these slabs and these see-through jacarana doors so that we can peek in on the water wheel like the creeps we are. And it doesn't look too good, but sadly, this is kind of the best I can do without any glass for right now. So we add our first shaft and at the end, ta-da, we place our very first working machine in the Create mod. Let's try this thing out. We throw an iron ingot underneath it, and bonk is right. It smashes it into an iron sheet, so it doesn't really matter how I pronounce ingot. I then sacrifice a few other victims to the bonk god, and very quickly, this becomes my entertainment for the night. And as much fun as that was to watch, the real reason we did that was to make a whisk, the next component for a mechanical mixer. So now that we've made that, we can just throw it next in line and start mixing things, right? Sadly, no. The mixer itself was the simple part. Now, we need to stock up on some good old taters for the next quest, which starts by mining even deeper into the mountain cave. We find some copper ore, which is actually useful in this mod pack, and we grab a little zinc too, which is another core resource in Create, but we're still gonna have to go further down. We're headed to the deep slate level. But first, we find this little miner's outpost. A cool little bed, and there's even a little chest of loot here. And, uh, was that TNT? Uh, yep, definitely TNT. Who rigs their own camp to explode? Uh, okay, actually, no, I would totally do something like that. Fair enough. Finally, in the depths, we find our first diamonds. And this texture pack makes diamonds look pretty good. We also grab a little bit of gold while we're down here. And this is going to be important for another little tool. And before we leave, we craft the diamonds up into a pick. And then we use said pick to get some obsidian. Now I think you guys see where this journey is gonna take us. See, to make brass, we need a blaze from the nether. We pop back onto the surface on day eight and a little too close to this orc camp than I was hoping. I gotta be honest, I kinda almost forgot about these ugly boys. But they do remind me, they send out a little goblin scout to bully me. Luckily, with my iron kit, a solo little goblin like this doesn't really have much of a chance. I give him a spank, and I start to get the nether portal set up right outside of my cave. A weird little habit that I have is I don't like to make nether portals inside my base, just because the sound of that nether portal is just so annoying. We stock upon food for our first trip to the nether, and I decide to expand another little farm here, which has, of course, potatoes. I then redo the outside of the cave, which is still admittedly really ugly, but hey, I'm trying here. I set down a bed, and finally, by day nine, we have a portal ready to go. Inside the nether, we get our first little bit of bad news. We don't have a nether fortress anywhere close to us. And some more bad news is I forgot to bring a blaze trap, so back we go. We press some gold for goggles, 
Then we press some iron for this, an empty blaze burner. So we can take this back and problem number one is solved. Now, we just need to find a fortress so that we can get a blaze. Which reminds me, of problem number two, we still have no idea where a fortress is. I think about looking for one, but then I remember, oh yeah, I'm lazy. After all, I've been wanting some glass for a hot minute, so let's go get distracted by that. I head out that night, and I start grabbing all the sand I can from the beach. As the sun rises on day 10, I'm happy because I have a ton of sand now. But I'm also pretty sad, because I know that day 10 will bring our first orc event, and I haven't been preparing at all. As I'm headed home on day 10, I feel happy because I don't see anything happening over at the orc camp. But that's just because this mighty orc savage has already beat me back to my house. He has an iron sword, so even with my armor, he still hits pretty hard. What's worse is that he's fast. He gets close enough to hit me before I can crit him, and then he backs off, so I can't put in any damage. But he can. Two hearts, and now I have to quickly back off and eat. I get a small hit in but I still get greedy and try for one more crit, but then I get super low. I have to play this safe. I just have to hit and run. So I eat and I get ready for one last attack. Got him. And he dropped loot, orc teeth. Those are gonna be important for later, I promise. Now that level of orc is pretty dangerous, definitely a lot more than goblins. So we're gonna need to be a lot stronger by day 20, but even savage orcs aren't as bad as my worst enemy, these crows. I give this one a quick slap, and I hope he learns his lesson. We then craft up our goggles, and this is actually kind of nice, because with brambles, we can wear them as an add-on instead of taking off our helmet. Goggles, very effective at making me look like a total dork. Oh, you know what? When I put them on my forehead like that, that actually does look kind of cool. Anyway, when we look at the machine that uses stress, it shows us how much is being used. If you look at something that creates stress, like a water wheel or a copyright strike, and then you see how much stress it creates. This water wheel makes 256 stress units, and we're only using 128, so we have plenty for that mixer if we ever get it. First, I decide before we go to the nether, we should get a kit upgrade, and we make copper gear. Better than iron gear, at least for now. So will this upgraded iron shield. Actually, this will help a lot. So let's test it out and go find that fortress. I find this little goblin warlock looking thing. I gotta say, it's pretty easy to kill, but when it dies, it shoots out these crazy demon beast things. To be honest, these things are the real danger of the warlocks. The goblin himself pretty much just found his big brother's robes and started role playing. But these things are the real nightmare to deal with. In the future, it's not even really worth killing these little goblin warlocks. Might as well just leave them alive. After a full day in the nether, I gotta admit, I am getting a little bit frustrated. Sometimes, you just get bad luck with nether seeds. But just as I start to get worried that we may never find a nether fortress, we see one and we start to climb up inside. I carefully look around because, remember, I'm not in diamond gear and I don't want to die and lose this map seed. I see a blaze and I decide to go for a hit and run tactic. I pull a quick yoink and I get my butt out of here. And it's a good thing too because I, I actually ran out of food on my way back to the portal. Woo. Day 12, and we get a chest full of our nether treasures, and then we make a depot. This makes using a press much easier, I'll show you. Now you can place a stack of items, and you don't need to worry about them despawning. I can just walk away and come back when all of this is done. Then, it's time to make our mixer. So a quick in-game tutorial lets me know that I have to place the blaze on the bottom followed by a basin, but honestly, this right here, don't pay attention to this. This placement's all wrong. This is my first time using Crate, and I'm going through a lot of tutorials to try to make sure that I do everything right, but some of this took me a little getting used to, if I'm being totally honest with you guys, and I'm going to cut out most of the mistakes I make, unless they're hilarious, of course. This way, you guys don't see any mistakes and try to do them in your own Create world, just to find out that I went back and fixed everything later in the video. But what I will show is the process of us sealing our first water wheel in glass so that it looks all pretty and such. We even add our very first cog, and I love how the create mod is like so animated and lively. You can really watch everything work and move in real time. I craft up a gearbox, which helps change the direction of the shafts pretty easily. I make this one point down, and then I have this small cogwheel pointing downwards. 
Then, connected on the side of that cog wheel, we can put our mixer, and boom, that cog turns the gear inside of the mixer, and the machine is powered. See how weird and complicated, yet fairly intuitive, the cog system can be? Welcome to Create. And this is only the beginning, too. I set up the blaze burner and the basin because, as I remind Jesse, we have to cook. The blaze burner does need fuel, but it'll take any kind of fuel that a furnace would, like wood. And soon, okay, um, I don't know if that's how you mix metal alloys together, but all this molten metal is just spinning out. Yeah, totally normal. Absolutely safe here, Mr. Foreman. But I don't really care about safety because now I have our very first brass and I am way too excited. Brass is the gateway to the full range of machines in the Create Mod. So this is in fact a big deal. Lucky Day 13 starts with us making a better looking production area. But we don't want to waste the view, so we make a glass wall with some wooden supports. Soon, we have stacks of brass, and we're ready to get kitted up proper. Brass gear is much better than iron. It's almost the same as diamond, it's just a little bit weaker in the chest plate, but still, it's a huge upgrade. I decide to see if there's yet another upgrade, and I look into something called an exoskeleton. But, uh, ooh, that looks complicated. Maybe another time. Instead, let's try making something a little more simple, like a mill. This will process some smaller items, like bone, to make a little extra bone meal, which is pretty nice. Also, it mills wheat, which, I mean, it's a mill. If you guys didn't see that one coming. It can turn one wheat into one bread, instead of in vanilla where you need three wheat to go into a bread. So in theory, it can triple our bread production. But I say in theory, because to make bread this way, from flour, we need to add a bucket of water to the mixer with the flour. Look, I'm positive that there's some way in the Create Mod to automate this, but come on guys, let's just be honest here. You guys want to see me spend some time fighting orcs, not opening up a bakery. Plus, bread has too many carbs and we've really got to watch our figure. Speaking of automating though, I do genuinely try to set up some kind of water system, but I think we're just going to have to save this for the Create Farmer video. Oops, spoilers. But I do give this a genuine try. But if it takes us all night to make 30 bread, we could probably just skip this for now. I'll save the mill for making other things, but you'll see that too. For now, let's go out front and start to work on our forest. I'm really loving the idea of turning this area out in front of the castle into a mystical purple forest. And also there's a bonus too. It means we won't have to look over and see those ugly green boys across the valley. And hey, it might even mask the smell a little bit too, but uh, that is a pretty big ask, admittedly. I gotta say, right here, living in a dwarf fortress and using a brass axe to cut down my enemies, it just feels so right, you know? I do a quick little check into the castle, and I see that this villager is trading tomatoes. So it looks like we're going to be headed down to Tomato Town to get a number one victory royale. But I gotta say, growing tomatoes by hand, it does kind of feel like peasant's work. My number one goal in this playthrough is to use my create engineering skills to improve the lives of our villager friends. And that starts by getting some wool from these wild sheep. Then we go around and grab some lavender, because I do love lavender. But really, I do have another use for this. So early on day 16, we're headed home when Big Daddy shows up. This is one of the stronger orcs that we face. And he says that he's very disappointed that Kitten hasn't been on Discord yet. And when I hear that, it's just about my cue to GTFO. Now he does send one of his little goblins after me, but it turns out he's just gobbling on these. No, 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 I'll stop. Like I said, I then use these lavender flowers in the mill to get some purple dye but also just a little bit of green dye. Yep, Create can get you green dye, no cactuses needed. And this is good, because a little green dye with a little white dye makes lime dye. Then Create lets us combine lime dye with the dough we made from the mill to create slime. Yeah, on top of that, slime is used for super glue, which is the next tool to make our machines. Now, if you watch this video for the tutorial section, pay attention. We're going to first need a mechanical bearing, a windmill bearing, and as many sails as you can get your hands on. Then we get the mechanical harvesters, a chute, which is basically just a cheap version of a hopper, and the radial chassis. And then we get a, a little bit entranced by this press. Not exactly sure what I'm doing. Just kind of sitting here watching this go up and down. And with those three gold sheets, we can now make a wrench, which is going to help out a lot. And yeah, I think we're ready to go here we head out to make our very first real big project. 
we put down the radial chassis in the dead center of the farm with a mechanical bearing on top of that. Green side down. Important, it's not the windmill bearing. That goes facing up on top of the mechanical bearing. Then you place a block, any block will do, and then on that block, you place your sails. Now the sails are kind of weird. They take a little bit of getting used to. They always want to go face down, like some people I know. But a little tip, you can place them correctly if you aim in the bottom corner right here. Then just keep adding sails with a minimum of eight. Then left click on the windmill bearing and, okay, okay, this is kind of weak, no lie. Hey, this is my very first try. Don't size shame me. We're gonna have to stop it for just a second so that we can add the arm with the harvesters and the chest. And I've got to admit right here, I did mess one thing up. We set up one portable interface on the arm and another one facing it about a block away attached to the ground. So that they, you know, just about kiss. We set up a chute underneath that, connected it to a chest to store up everything that the farm produces. And on day 17, as the sun rises on a night of hard work, we forgot our super glue. Yeah, I told you I forgot something kind of important. It's a super easy fix though. We just have to place a glob of glue and stick the arm onto the chassis and then boom, auto tomato farm go burp. Okay, it's a little bit slow, but to be honest, you don't need this thing to be fast. You just need it to work. As it goes around, it only harvests the crops that are ready to be picked. And it even replants them, so it really does do all of the work itself. Now, I will admit, I do think I overheard some of the lady villagers in the castle giggling at our <clears throat> unsized farm. So let's try and scale things up a little bit. We're going to create another farm. So we need to get all of the same components ready to run what will become a potato farm. The base is the same, no need to add more bearings or anything like that. The only thing we really need to change is we're going to crank up the power by adding more sails. If for, for nothing else, just to make this look like a real legitimate windmill. And yes, I'm finally trying to say windmill, no windmills here, <laughs> which I like better by the way. If I want to say windmill, I will. It's not wrong if the captain says it, but don't try to use that as a legal defense, okay? Before we finish all of this work though, I head out and I plant all of my jacaranda saplings because I almost have the entire castle fully covered. I then go out and do a little sheep night raid and grab some wool when I see this. It's an orc, but not just any orc. This is the orc leader, a weird orc savage, a warlock that casts wither spells at you and he can run away super fast. He manages to disappear before I can kill him. And I'm legit terrified of when he'll come back. This is my new rival. But I can't sit here paralyzed in fear all day. I have to press on. I add on as many sails as I can. Then I start to make the arm of the farm. <laughs> arm arm. This bad boy is going to be long enough to cover the entire farm eight blocks. We craft up six more harvesters that night and we sleep because we're tired. <clears throat> Definitely not hiding from that weird orc. No, 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 no. Day 18 and we get all of those harvesters in place on the arm with a ton of swords chests on the backside, which we are definitely going to need. I set up one of the interfaces on the arm and then I get started setting out all the potatoes to fill up the farm. But <laughs> I admit I'm impatient. I want to start this beast up right now. Oh, wow. This thing really moves. It's cool, but at the same time, it's honestly kind of terrifying. I mean, I would not want to get in the way of those blades. Whew. But the real reason I did this is because I actually want to see the circular path that it travels in. Now I can see what blocks I need to plant potatoes on. So I quickly scurry in to till all the soil. However, I make sure to give these blades plenty of space when they come back around. Now an automated farm like this, I, I don't actually think it hurts you. But when you're 19 days into your playthrough, yeah, I'll let you guys test that out. We then set up the standard interface part of the farm, so now we'll get to see if it's all working. Sure enough, these two lovebirds kiss, and even though we barely just started planting, we are already getting stacks of taters. This is perfect. This should be just enough to replant and cover the whole farm. Now we can sit upon our brown throne as the potato gods we are. I gotta say, this whole setup does look pretty cool. Clearly, it's a new age machine, but it's not totally out of place like some futuristic thing either. For my very first real practical useful project, I'm pretty happy. Now I decide to head to the castle and switch up our farmer because tomatoes are fine and all, 
Well, let's be honest. We're potato kings and queens. Now, as awesome as today was, it totally used up my entire andesite stocks. So we're going to have to spend some time and head back into the mountain and try to find as much as we can. I got to admit, I'm so happy about all the progress we've made that I totally forgot about that weird orc. And I've totally forgotten that tomorrow is another orc event. Hmm, I smell smoke. and It's not even 420, so that's not good. And this is why we can't have nice things. Every one of my jacaranda trees has been burnt down by these marauding orcs. The ants will hear about this one. The biggest thing here is that the auto farms are mostly made of wood. So I need to spend the morning running around and putting out all these fires. I need to focus on the ones that are closest to the farms and to the castle, because I don't think I could save the castle if it caught on fire. So now we have a bunch of floating logs and a bunch of ash everywhere. My day just got a lot more heartbreaking too, as I'm gonna need to try and clean all of this up. I gotta admit, the orcs win this time, but there is a slim silver lining. Some saplings made it through unburnt, and some of the ungrown saplings are now popping up. The forest definitely took an L here, but I could bring it back. If for nothing else, just purely as a sign to the orcs that we aren't going down that easy. There's still some fire burnings around the orc camp. Looks like they aren't done either. Is that, is that a bard creeper? Aw, creeper bard. When we said your album was gonna blow up, we didn't mean it like that. Horrible dad jokes aside, uh, this event wasn't too bad. Sure, I loved that forest. I really thought that looked cool, but at least the castle is untouched. Of course, our base is still way out of their reach, and I might even find a little bit of use for all this leftover ash. Day 21 and it's time to start a new project. I look out at the cave and decide it's time to expand deeper into it. And by that night, I've crafted up all the components for our next project. I start to set up a bunch of wooden supports connected into the walls to build our next project off of, because it will be hanging in the middle of the open cave. Now you're probably thinking, why doesn't Captain just show the components he's collected throughout the day? Don't worry, little viewer. This is just another auto farm and I don't want to bore you guys by showing me making the same components that I did for the last two projects. I start setting out a little border all around the farm with glass. And by day 22, we start to set down a radial chassis on the floor of the sand. We then start to set up the arm the exact same way we did with the last two farms. Now this one is a little bit smaller. I mean, we're inside of a cave, kind of has to be. After all, the fact that this is inside of a cave means that the orcs can't threaten it. Instead of using a windmill, I start to run a shaft from our first water wheel. I take it to the right, out into the cave. We then set up another gearbox that runs the shaft all the way out in the middle of the farm. We get it started and uh, it's going like 100 miles an hour backwards. So I replace all the stuff on the arm so that it's switched around to the opposite side. Give me a break, guys. At least this thing is moving in the right direction now. I start to set up the interfaces and prepare for the zombie attack, but apparently he's got something else to worry about. Seems to really be in a hurry. Anyway, by that night, we have the interface ready and most of the glass is in place too. Now, you've probably been watching this, trying to figure out why I used sand. And if you guessed, it's because we are gonna grow sugarcane. Well, that's a good guess. And it might come later, <clears throat> cough, totally will. <clears throat> but for now, we're gonna have another water-based crop. And in order to grow that properly, we need to move the sand down one more block. So I have to build the whole thing a little bit lower. We add in all the sand back. Have you guys guessed the crop yet? Well, I'll give you guys a little bit of a hint. We're gonna have to head back to that ocean to get some of it. And on day 23, that's exactly what we do. While I'm running past the orc camp once again, Big Daddy wants to come and give me some love. He has a little minion come with him this time, and I need to be careful not to get cornered by these two. Try to use the steep hillside and keep the height advantage. But while attacking the little one, the big one kind of puts me in a bad spot here. I take a hit and fall damage, and I have to pull back to eat a little bit. I don't really have anything to gain from taking this fight, so I start to really pull back. To be honest, I don't really want to escalate things too much with the orcs, especially right now. I don't want to have to deal with any more burnt forests. Besides, the sea calls me. As a captain, I must answer. I find this old ship, but uh, this one's not quite up to captain standards, so I just grab the loot and leave. But before I do, I decide why not check this treasure map, and I see that it's literally right here. 
so I might as well. I see this massive ravine, so clearly the treasure can't be down here, right? I start digging right next to the ravine and I waste an entire day looking for it. And it turns out it was down in the ravine under this one piece of sand. Boo. I mean, I'm going to take the booty, but I'm not going to be happy about it. And of course, I do have to leave a little bit of room in my inventory so that we can actually collect the thing we came here to get in the first place. Yep, that's right. We're going to be making a kelp farm. With my pockets full of slimy green goo, I run back home past the orc camp once again. When I get back home, I set down a little extra layer of sand. And this is just easier so I can add buckets full of water on the very top. Soon, we have our own mega aquarium. I jump in and I start planting all the kelp. Now you might be wondering, why did I rush a kelp farm so fast? Well, the first reason is because dried kelp is a great source of renewable fuel and can be used for furnaces and a lot of other machines in the Create Mod. But also, there's a ton of machines that need dry kelp as a component. Then, I also set up this furnace system to cook more of the kelp. So, just like Thanos, once again, I use the kelp to create the kelp. By day 25, I have an awesome hanging kelp farm automatically making coal substitutes. And I gotta say, I love this thing. Creative uses of these machines is just one of the many ways that this mod really starts to shine. Now, in my last two videos, it was right around here at day 25 that I started to use a portable drill using immersive engineering. Let's see what the Create mod has in store when it comes to a power drill. Once again, I see that it takes these mechanical crafters. This needs polished rose quartz, and that needs rose quartz that has, well, been polished. In order to polish things, you need sandpaper, which takes, you guessed it, you little geniuses, sand and paper. But paper is going to take another little adventure. This time, instead of running towards the ocean, I decide to go the opposite way and head over the mountain when I learn a very valuable lesson. This mountain has snow and crevasses that you can fall into just like quicksand. I love myself a cozy snow day, but this is a little too much. Luckily, I have a shovel in my hot bar and I can pop my head out and take a breath. But seeing my health bar turn black like that is pretty unsettling, so I build my way out and uh, yeah, let's try to go the other way around the mountain. Well, if we can't go over it, I guess we'll just have to go around it. There's a, there's a nursery rhyme that goes like that, right? I'm not just making that up in my head, am I? Anyway, I see a bunch of huge, deep caves all around the mountainsides, and I'm tempted to go exploring, but I want to stay focused. When I see this. It's a big stone building that honestly kind of looks like an old dwarven ruin. And so I decide to go exploring. I mean, it would only be thematically correct to delve deeper. And when I say deeper, I mean deeper. This staircase goes so far down, I'm starting to get a little bit sick here. But finally, we do manage to get to the bottom and I start to look around for my dwarven brothers, but uh, this doesn't sound good. Right away, we find a mob spawner. And I was right, I guess these really are ruins. This structure is from roguelike dungeons. We really need to be careful down here and only find what we need, paper, and then we should get out. However, we'll quickly find something much better. That's right, kitten slippers. Look at me, I got little kitties on my feet. God tier kit achieved. I head a bit deeper and I find some old living quarters. And I kind of feel bad. This place is weirdly kind of haunting. Just then, bingo. Now we should probably turn back but maybe just a little bit of more exploring? I mean, honestly, what's the worst that could happen? So of course, down here, I hear the orcs. Now I know what happened to the dwarves that came before me. I keep hearing them, but at the same time, I keep on finding loot. I'm tempted, getting more and more greedy, and I start going lower and lower. And soon, we start to get into the dungeon levels. Ooh, creepy. Kind of smells like my laundry basket down here. The lower we go, the tougher the mobs get, and we still haven't even found those orcs. Down near the very bottom, I find this tomb, and inside of it, there's a cave spider spawner. I hate these things. Of course one of them gets me, and now I'm running for my life. And also, I'm making cat noises every time I take damage? Is that for real? I take a break, heal, and I decide it's probably a good idea to head home. I start to head back up a level, when the biggest pack of goblins that I've ever seen jumps me all at once. I pull back, and I fight them, but they push me down into the dungeon again. I managed to get away from them. I'm stuck down here now. Every time I look in a chest and get distracted, they jump down and ambush me when I'm not looking. I managed to clear a few out, but I'm thinking that my only option 
is to head deeper. I find this little hole. Here we go. I jump down it and go even deeper, and right away, it's a nightmare. The mobs down here are decked out in diamond gear, and I panic. I run from them, and I fall even deeper into this gigantic hole. And there's water, which I think is good, but it's a trap. Now they follow me, and I'm stuck down here together with them. If it wasn't for this little bit of water here, I'd be dead. Because I can use it to escape. And I manage to find a cave off to the side of the dungeon, and I just sit here and I hide. This zombie with thorns chases me, and I think I'm definitely making cat noises now every time I take damage. After all this, I decide I'm no longer playing along with the orcs anymore. I decide I'm going to dig my way out instead of trying to go back up through the ruins. I come up to the deepest floor of the dungeon yet, the nether floor. I pop my head out into the floor and I see some bad news. This floor is crawling with geared out mobs. I run back down to the cave and find another way out. And I find another miner's camp. But instead of a TNT trap, I see that there's a creeper and it really is avoiding me. The cat shoes act like a cat and they scare away any creepers. That, or I'm just still stinky from that dungeon. This zombie gives me one more reminder that I really need to leave. So I start to dig my way out. I finally dig my way back up to the dungeon level. And now I'm booking it, looking for an exit. I do manage to make it up to the living area level. And just before I leave, I find this cherry blossom tree and I yoink it. It's wasted down here anyway, but before I leave, I take one last look around at what my dwarven ancestors were able to build, and unfortunately what they lost. I make sure that I do not join them. Unfortunately, just before I can get out, I run into the mighty Belrog. I remind him that he shall not pass. After all, I've already fallen down to the pit, and now I've come back as Captain the White. And freedom. We finally made it. Now I'm loaded with a ton of good loot, but I still want to make sure I can grab some sugarcane so that we never have to go into the dwarven ruins for paper ever again. I come back, and I've never been so happy to see this castle before. The forest is healing, the farms are looking pretty good, and sure enough, my base is safe and sound. After that crazy adventure, I take a little quick break and take a breath, but with only three days until our next orc event, there's really no time to rest. We make the sandpaper, remember? That was the whole reason we went on that adventure in the first place. With it, we can now polish the rose quartz. Before I forget, we're gonna upgrade our very first farm. At this point, we're selling potatoes, not tomatoes, so this really isn't that helpful anymore. Time to get some sand and water into a checkered pattern, and time to make a legit auto sugarcane farm. Speaking of potatoes, oh, look at this chest. There we go. The Tater King is happy now. We spend the night doing some stonks and regaling the villagers with my tales of the dwarven ruins. And finally, on day 28, we now can make our mechanical crafters. We turn our polished rose quartz into electron tubes using some iron sheets, and then we use some brass to make brass casings. We then can get some vanilla crafting tables, and boom, we get a ton of mechanical crafters. <laughs> Honestly, probably more than we'll ever need, but I'm just excited we finally have these. Now, we just need to find a good spot to set these up. We add another platform at the end of the kelp farm, and we connect it to the stone walls surrounding it in the cave. Then, we have to extend our shaft, but not like that, gross, all the way to the platform to power the mechanical crafters. Now, the rain stops, which is good, but so does our shaft. One water wheel alone can only do so much, and it just doesn't have enough stress units to power this new add-on. I decide I'm going to continue to use this water flowing through our cave to power our next machines too. I open up a section of the kelp farm so that water can flow out and power our new water wheels. Okay, here comes the jump. I'm not scared, you're scared. Woo. Then we set down three wheels that are being powered from the water coming out of the kelp farm. We then place some wood under the wheels so that the water will flow underneath the wheel and generate more stress units. There's also a little soul sand trick, but I never really got the hang of it, so I give up. Doesn't matter, because we're going to have plenty of power as soon as I use this gearbox to move the power up to the rest of the system. But there is a small problem here. See, the shafts are not turning the right way, and the gearbox, it can't be placed here. We're going to have to disconnect the old shaft. This isn't really too much of a loss anyway. After all, the old system could only power up one mechanical crafter. The new water wheel system should be able to do all the work by itself. But hey, for everyone who's OCD and wants me to use every little bit of power, 
I even make a little side cog system so that the old water wheel is working too. And now we can begin our stress test, L literally. I keep on adding more and more mechanical crafters to get enough to make our drill. And we have enough. But let's add a little bit more. What's the worst that could happen, right? Let's try to push it to its limits. And well, there it is. We get to about lucky 13 before we just can't add any more. Now this kind of sucks because there are going to be way bigger recipes which use these mechanical crafters in the future. But for now, let's not worry about that too much. I want to get working on our power drill. This is one of the simplest mechanical crafting recipes that you can do. It just takes some brass sheets on the top, a brass pick in the middle, some andesite and brass casing. I honestly just want to see if I can get this whole mechanical crafter thing working. And after figuring out how all of the arrows are supposed to point, we do in fact get this whole mess working. And we get a power drill. Pretty cool, but right away, I do not want to overhype this thing. It's not nearly the same drill that we got in immersive engineering. Very different. Let's go over the pros. It doesn't take biodiesel and a whole complex system of machines to fuel it. It can burn anything that a furnace can, including planks and including dry kelp. See? Now the cons are, well, it just acts like a normal pickaxe. One block, not nine, and it uses one fuel per block, so it's kind of expensive. With all this dried kelp, we might get some use out of it, sure, but I don't really know if it's going to help us, especially with our next orc event. So, on the start of day 30, I decide to check to see if the forest is on fire again. Worse, an armored orc is at the front door, and I'm trapped in here, and I can't go anywhere until I deal with this. But. I managed to slice him up pretty easily, and the castle and farm seems to look fine. I can even hear the villagers up in the castle still alive, so that was a pretty easy event. Then, of course, again, I see that I've spoken too soon. I come around the corner, and I find a brand new orc camp that has spawned just outside the castle walls. It is threatening my home and the castle itself, so I need to take this fight. I see two minions in heavy armor and a boss behind them and I use my shield, but even with it, their hits knock me back, and they're trying to surround me. I try to land my strikes with the right timing, and I do a small bit of damage every time, and with my new brass gear, I'm thinking I might actually be able to tank some of these trades. But I can't be sloppy here. With how quickly they move, they could surround me. They're starting to get behind me, and I need to run back home. Here, and then I stop right here. I can use this height advantage to keep them down in that hole, where I can hit them and they can't hit me. I managed to kill my first one. And another, and another. The height advantage is working. For the boss, I'm getting some good damage in, but now this guy is just a little too big. I actually have to back off for a second here. He runs and hits me and then he backs off before I can trade. He pushes me down in the hole and now he has the height advantage. And so I'm not even gonna try to fight this right here. I make sure to get back up and then I push him back down. He's low, and I decide to jump down and finish him. That was a pretty tough fight, and it could have gone both ways, and it's only day 30. But we aren't quite done yet. I need to make sure that this abomination is wiped clean off the map. It's too close to the castle to be ignored at this point. We start to light it up everywhere we can, and of course I manage to light myself on fire, because the only thing that can defeat me is me. We continue to light everything up and burn this whole thing down as the sun sets on this battle. And I hate to admit it, but as much as I'm trying to keep the peace with the orcs, I did feel pretty good to go on the offensive there and actually do some damage to these monsters, even if they were on the offensive in the first place. And I even get to try out my new drill a little bit, and I cut all of this down to the dirt. And by that night, there's nothing left. Plus, the orcs didn't burn down my trees again, so after making another axe, I go to harvest some saplings from my new cherry blossom tree. And I gotta say, this towering tree right here looks pretty amazing. I chop this down, and I make sure to collect all the saplings and all the wood. I'm gonna replant a new fiery forest to remember the victory on day 30. And their wood might actually be the best part. It's a really good looking deep crimson log. And it's a perfect addition to our growing fortress. And I speed up the growing of the trees and then I see that they have a bunch of dimension. And with all this color and the shadows coming in, they look really good. 
I start to make some planks so that I can finish up this brand new room I'm adding on. But I want to cut down as few trees as possible. So I'm trying to look into create and see if there's any way that I can get more planks per log. Sure enough, you can make a sawmill and it gives you six planks instead of four. That's pretty good. Now at the time, I honestly didn't know how much work this would take to set up. So in the end of all this, you'll have to let me know if it's really worth it for two extra planks. But hey, now I'm committed. So I look at the in-game tutorial and I see that it's intended to be used on a belt system and you know what, why not? I try to set up this little belt system here in my house, but it needs to be bigger and this thing is already taking up all of my living space. I decide to break it all down and start over. And at the start of day 32, I move to the new platform. After all, on the left here, we already have the system of cogs that aren't being used yet. So I start to set things up and this looks like a good step one and oh God. Uh, by the next day, I managed to totally, uh, this right here, this took way longer than it really should have. Honestly, I, I probably should have just gone on YouTube and like looked up some kind of tutorial, but something inside me told me that I wanted to do this myself. All this mess and all I wanted was two more planks for my wood. Okay, let's try this. We have a chest with a tunnel that has a belt leading to the saw. Oh, looks like it works and the logs jump right over the saw. <laughs> Guess I don't blame them, right? And by the next morning, we try a different setup and it looks cool and all, but this actually turns out to work even worse. Okay, finally by that night, I try to hook the chest and the tunnel directly onto the saw and it finally works. Then I add a chest at the bottom to catch the finished product, and yes, it strips the logs, so I am going to have to run them through one more time to get those planks. But it does work. Now what I can do is I can dump a bunch of logs in this upper chest, then I can come back, take the strip logs, and then I can run them through again, and I can get a ton more planks. It's a little janky, so now that I've gotten it to work, I'd like to say it's worth it. No. Yeah, there's no way that two more planks is worth the three days it took to build this thing, which is still kind of weak. But hey, I did design a machine all by myself, and I'm proud of it. You can't take that away from me. Go ahead, say something mean in the comments. You won't even know if I cry anyways. But in all due seriousness, this system is actually super useful later in the video when it comes to another project, so it isn't all a waste. As for right now, the farm, castle, and now Blossom Forest looks amazing. I'm feeling so good in this mystical forest of mine. I even spent some time feeding the wildlife. No ulterior motive here. No, 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 no. I see that these goblins are trying to kill some cows, but they can't do that. Only I get to kill the cows. See? Finally, we get enough bookshelves to finish our library, which is good, but then we have to deal with this weird enchantment system that came with this mod pack. Honestly, I love everything about this mod pack, except for this. I kind of try to make it work though, but I, I don't like it. So on day 36, I kind of just give up. I'll come back to this later. Instead, I decide it's time to expand the fortress, which for right now, will be done using our blossom wood, which I love. We see a few more little goblin friends here, but after getting a whiff of their smell, I decide probably best to just leave them alone. I throw all of my wood into the salma system because I'm still convinced that I can get it to pay off somehow. And then I get right back to chopping. I spend a whole day and night chopping down wood. And the reason really is because it's just so hard to find the logs in all of these leaves. The good news is we do have a ton of wood, so we're really ready for our next expansion. And of course, we make this enchantment library that I don't even like look a little bit nicer. Then we head out to get all of our potatoes. This right here makes everything worth it though. Ooh, boil them, mash them, weaponize them? Maybe. But for now, let's turn our brown into green and sell these for all the emeralds that we can. Then we collect a little bit more wool, which means it's that time again. We crank out some sails, and then we start to expand the fortress even deeper into the mountainside. This time, we're using all that beautiful red blossom wood. We make a small platform off to the side and throw down a huge cogwheel. Then on top of the cogwheel, we build a windmill. The idea here is we're gonna need a little more power for those mechanical crafters. Remember, they still don't have enough power to do the real big projects, which we're gonna need to make our next component. But you already might be noticing a little problem with this whole setup. The cog has a ton of stress units, but it's moving way too slow. We need to find a way to speed up this rotation. 
The basic concept is this. You add a large cogwheel to a shaft. Then you add a small cogwheel off to the side of the large cog, which of course will naturally be spinning faster. Now in order to do this effectively and give ourselves some room, I decided to do this underneath this platform. So as you guys can see right here, every time I add a small cog, it is spinning much quicker. Then by adding a large cog onto that shaft, it will too be spinning much faster. We repeat this process of putting a small cog on a large cog and then a large cog on the shaft and soon the shaft is spinning fast enough to match the speed of the water wheels and therefore the mechanical crafters. By that night, we have a clean looking setup on the top, but underneath is the beating heart of cogs and shafts and it really looks like a steampunk engineer's dream come true. The best part of CreateMod is all the cog work here that I really love. To do another little quick stress test here, I'm actually going to break the cog wheel that goes to the original water wheel setup just to test out and see how much stress this is producing. Sure enough, the 13 blocks work, so at the bare minimum, we can at least say that the two systems together can make 26 mechanical crafters. Now that should be plenty of stress to help us with our next big item, the crushing wheel. Something this cool, even the orcs would have to respect. We quickly set up all of the components to make it, and sure enough, it starts pushing everything together. And after everything is assembled and been pushed down to the bottom, we get our crushing wheels, which is good. What's not good is that it's day 40 and the orcs are coming. Now I know I do some dumb stuff here and there, but this time I was really messing around. I figured if I just hang out in my house the whole playthrough, they can't come and get to me, right? I mean, it's not like they can open doors. Well, that night, they brought the fight into my fortress. This orc, Iron Group Leader, just jumped from the cave opening right into the middle of my fortress. So it's a really good thing that he got stuck right here. If he's the leader, then I'm sure there's going to be more to come. Sure enough, a pack of orc has shown up at my front door. But like I said, they can't come through doors, right? Until they can. And this one shoots his way in, and I almost scream. I'm down to three hearts and hiding on top of my own crafters. I have to cower up here on my machines and just hope that they can't find a way to get to me. Luckily, I just happen to have a bow from an old skeleton, but only four arrows. So sooner or later, I have to fight them hand to hand. And by my count, there's only one left. Ah, nope. This leader was using him as bait and gets me to come out. Then he flanks me and I take a ton of damage, but I am okay. Then another one comes from the base and surprise attacks me. So once again, I panic and we're back to hiding up on the crafters. I managed to get off one more shot, but it's my last one. Not good. What's also not good is another orc sneaks around and gets to me. I'm healing up and I'm trying to make sure that they can't climb up to me, because after they got through that door, I have no idea what they're capable of. Then I quickly scan around to see if there's any left. Turns out, hiding away in my fortress all day only makes things worse. It means that they'll bring the fight to me. But in the end, the forest and the farms are okay. There's no camps out here, so it isn't as bad as it could have been. So we jump back into our base. And on day 41, I guess this means I can go back to focusing on my projects and I add some fences and railing around the edge of the fortress so that I don't fall, cause you know I would. I then head back to my enchantment table, cause I'm gonna have to be a lot stronger for these next fights. But uh, yeah, this system, I really don't like this system at all. I actually decided to go into Curse Forge and just turn this mod off. Sorry guys, if you wanna play this mod and you wanna go ahead and learn this one, good luck. But for me, I'm out. Turning that mod off paid off right away because I get silk touch, which is super important for our next project. So I look out into this open area and start to plan where we're gonna build it. By early morning on day 42, we start to build upwards. For this, I'm gonna use a ton of logs and build directly into the walls of the mountain. So we're gonna need to spend a little bit more time chopping down our trees. But in the light, I can see just how amazing the mountainside really looks. The castle, these beautiful trees, the snow caps, this is a true dwarves paradise come true. Now we can use all the wood we've collected and start to build upwards where the wind comes whistling through the mountain pass. This upward breeze will give us uh, plenty of wind to power our, um, okay, 
I'm, I'm trying to make some like in-game excuse here as to why a windmill would work inside a cave, but I mean, come on, it looks cool and it's the best way of making power for us right now. I don't want to just make like a hundred water wheels. These add so much more depth to our builds and they just look so cool. Look, don't, don't read into it too much, okay? I set up these furnace systems here to cook our kelp and ash for a little bit more XP for the enchantments. We get right to work making our next windmill. You might be thinking, I placed the windmill bearing upside down. No, no. This is going to be a hanging windmill. That's right, I'm going to build this whole thing upside down. Of course, this means we have to go out and harass some more sheep, but at this point, that's pretty much par for the course. I decide to lure them a little bit closer to the castle so that I can feed them and shear them more often and make even more sales. Now, we can get started on our signature hanging windmill. Bet you've never seen anything like this before. And yeah, I know the reason you haven't seen it is because it's not practical, and it really doesn't make any sense, but shut up! We've already been over how none of this makes any sense anyway. It looks cool, and it makes a lot of power. That's all you need to know. Day 45, I'm back in the castle, hanging out with the villagers and chilling with the sheep. By the way, villagers are people, right? Or are they animals? Because you make them breed the same way you make animals. You know what? I don't really want to think about it too much. All I know is this castle looks so cool. So after looking over all this, I decide that my next goal is that I'm going to make my fortress look just as good. So in order to do that, for this next expansion, we aren't going to use just some wood planks. Uh-uh. We're going to craft up some ash bricks. And on top of those, we're going to be using some copper casing. We open up the lower edge fences, and we start to add on the beginnings of our ore processing system. This is a complicated setup, but it's essentially a must for anyone who's getting really into the create mod, like we are. We're going to focus around a central path in the middle, which has two vertical gearboxes on each side of it. In the middle of the path, we then place some shafts horizontally and place the crushing wheels on top of the two vertical gearboxes. Hmm, doesn't that kind of look like a face to you guys? Anyway, we run a mechanical belt all the way underneath the crushing wheels. And by day 46, we set down the depot at the end of the belts. We have this chest right before the end of the belts with the brass funnel facing into the chest away from the belts. See the arrow going into the chest? It has to be brass. This way we can add a filter. And on that filter, we're gonna set up all of the crushing ores. And it has to be set to deny. That's important so that everything else will be pulled into this chest and only the crushed ores will go on to go to the depot. After the depot, we need to have a little space here because we're going to put a basin with even more belts after that. We connect this whole thing with cogs and shafts just like so. And each one of these cogs has an individual purpose. This first one is so that we can place an encased fan. When powered and with water in front of it, the encased fan will clean the crushed ore. Don't worry, you'll see how it works in a bit. Then comes the basin next to the depot with some more belts leading away on the other side. We have another brass funnel with another filter, which will say accept to all of the nuggets. This will stop the crush ore on the depot. The fan will clean it. Then once they've turned into nuggets, they will be accepted into the basin. And while I confess the best nuggets are for eating, these ones will be pretty good because they'll be pressed by a mechanical press, the same exact one that we used in the beginning of this playthrough. And to power this press, we're gonna have to use the next cog in the system. We're just gonna stack four more cogs in a line and then connect it with a shaft. We're gonna craft up a little bit more casing so that we have some room to add the very last chest that will hold all the finished pressed ingots. Which means, finally, it's done. We just need to add a funnel to pull the ingots off the belt into the chest. Super easy, right? Yeah, I know, this is definitely really complicated, but the process of building this all and tweaking everything is so much fun. It's all pretty intuitive if you think about it, and it all feels so functional and reasonably realistic. Now, we only have one problem. We need to get this thing powered up. We're gonna have to once again, get the slow spinning cogs of the windmill up to speed. We get another system, large cog wheels, with the small cog wheels off on the side. And I gotta say, I'm getting pretty good at this. We just need to run the whole thing all the way down to the processing level. Well, it's all set up. Hope this works. Here we go. And it works. It actually works. It, oh, it actually doesn't work. The belts are going in all different directions. 
Luckily, we just need to add one gearbox to the shafts that are connected to the belts. But man, I gotta say that kind of killed the whole climactic moment there. And on top of that, when I actually look up at the windmill, it's all uneven and it's kind of underwhelming. So in my rage, I decide I'm gonna take my anger out on these little dum-dums. Nah, I could never hurt you guys. Oh, unless I was hungry, then it's pork chop time. But the only thing I hunger for is knowledge. Knowledge and more sales. There we go. Now that's looking much better. And speaking of looking better, I start to take some copper shingles and make a huge supporting arch all the way through the middle of the mountain. After all, we promised we're gonna be looking just as good as that castle out front. I'm gonna to need to add a little bit more style than just some logs as supports, even though I do think they look pretty good in places. I work on this all through the night, and by day 48, we have a solid looking copper archway that will lead us right to our new ore processing setup. All we need now is, well, some ores. I decide I'm gonna test it out on one piece of raw copper just to see what we get. So the raw copper goes down the belt, gets crushed, then the XP gets pulled into the chest. The crushed ore then stops on the depot, gets washed, turns into nuggets, and the nuggets get pressed. Kadoosh. And we only get one in God. What? What? What's the whole point of this ore processing system if the outcome's gonna be exactly the same? You know what, it is called an ore processing system, so let's try this with an ore instead. Let's see how many presses we get. One, two, three, four, five? Whoa, one ore turns into five ingots? This right here, this is a huge yield. One ore gets five ingots and XP? That's bigger than any immersive engineering or nuclear craft ore processing system. Now, the only downside of the ore processor like this is that it takes a longer time to process everything. So we need to keep it full as much as possible and cut down on any downtime. But just as I want to get this started and go mining, the weird boy strikes again. He's casting withering spells from the shadows. I seriously cannot manage to find him. But if that's all we're going to get for day 50, honestly, I'm kind of fine with it. If he's our day 50 mini boss, I'll make sure to find him another time. Like I said, I want to get this ore processor up and running. Really test its limits. Unfortunately, this guy keeps finding me and he keeps harassing me. I think he's even following me into the mines, which is kind of a little bit worrying actually. But I need to stay focused. I see a few goblin boys running around, but I don't know where the weird boy went. Ah well, I'll find him later. I head out that night past the castle and find another cave that I had seen on day 25 and I start mining. I stay here all night till by day 50, I see a few little goblins, but honestly, this is a disappointing halfway event. Well, little did I know. I head back and I see that the forest is once again on fire. This time it's even crazier and the orcs are even in danger. They're so destructive, they're even killing themselves. The bigger trees mean bigger fire, but that's not even close to the biggest thing that happened today. Soon, I see it, the castle, <laughs> or should I say the lack thereof. There's only a crater where it once stood. I didn't kill the weird boy when it was attacking me. I ran away and he took his rage out on the innocent villagers instead. Every time I try to run and hide from the orcs, they come back stronger and do more damage. I feel terrible. I, I could have stopped this. I see the very last survivor, a badly damaged iron golem. I try to fix him up because it's the least I can do at this point. My sugarcane farm got torn up, but that's hardly even on my mind. The whole reason for it being there, the whole reason for me being here was to try to help these villagers to use my tools and my knowledge to make their lives better. And I failed. Now, my only purpose is to survive. But if they could level a whole castle in just one night, let's just say I better work on my defenses. I'm pretty upset about this. I finish the night by making a two block lip around the mouth of my base so that nobody can come in. I take one last look out into the burning wasteland where my friends, it's time to go to sleep. Day 51, and speaking of ruining the big hype, I load the ore processor with a ton of great loot, but it doesn't really feel that exciting now. 
I filled this up, but at what? The cost of all my friends? And what's worse is that the weird boy reminds me that this war isn't even over. He's still coming for me. I placed this banner in honor of the fallen villagers and to remind the orcs that I'm not done either. Okay, let's try not to get distracted. I get efficiency on my pick, and soon I have a pretty good silk touch pick. I start to head out, and it starts to rain. That's why I have water on my face. It's not because I'm crying. Seriously, the, the rain and this thunderstorm come right on cue. I was really upset at this point, and I didn't even really know how I was going to move on. At the very least, for all that it was hyped up to be, the ore processor is making a ton of good mats. It even gets us some extra redstone out of just regular ores. I head out that night, trying to clean up the forest when the weird boy comes back to try to finish the job. He's even casting these magic missiles too. Has he gotten stronger? The main big bad. I could get my revenge right here. I go straight in with no care for my own safety. And for a second, I actually thought maybe I got him, but I see that he still has half a heart and he keeps teleporting away. I got really beat up here and I resorted to eating raw potatoes for health. And if you've seen any of my Twitch streams, you know I hate it when people do this. And by day 52, it's still raining, there's still a ton of ash, the forest is still a mess, and we aren't any closer to stopping the orcs. I spend the whole day trying to get all of the floating logs cleaned up and grab all the ash. I make this temporary little jump bridge that's only two blocks long. Super easy for me, obviously, but I'm hoping that the orcs won't be able to get any further into my base now. I start to cook up some more ash and check out the processor. And I gotta say, at least this is making me pretty happy. I get a ton of copper and zinc so that I can make a ton of brass. And a bunch of emotes, I guess. These things are getting pretty annoying if I'm being real. I also start to look into better weapons. The orc teeth can be made into some pretty cool stuff. The orc hammer takes orc teeth and a little orc iron to make. And we've been hunting orc long enough to have a little bit of both. Sadly, I think we're one orc teeth, or one orc tooth uh, short, so we're not gonna be able to make this. I decide to look into gear that's made through the create mod to see if it can help us out instead. The exoskeleton is looking a lot better right now. It just takes a precision mechanism. And it's a bit uh, weird to make, but I can figure it out and I'll show you. First, we take some brass sheets so that we can make a deployer. We can add that to the first water wheel chain since it only takes 92 stress units. Then we add a depot at the bottom and now we just need to get a little gold. Smash that into a sheet and here comes the tricky part. We set the gold sheet down on the depot under the deployer. And now we have to place in the deployer's hand a small cogwheel, then a large cogwheel, then an iron nugget. And yes, in that order or else. Then we need to do this four more times, all in the correct sequence. Now, is this stressful <laughs> with my horrible memory? Yes. But as long as you craft everything up before you start, you just need to rotate through everything five times. And there you go. So early on day 54, we head over to the mechanical crafters. We start to make sure that they're the right size and the arrows are all facing the right way. That beautiful precision mechanism goes dead center, surrounded by a lot of brass sheets and ingots and finally, we put the cogs in the shoulder and on the back, and hey. Now, this does have the base stats of normal brass armor, which means it's pretty much just like diamond. And also, need I say, it does look pretty cool. If it has fuel, it gives you haste and strength, perfect for a face-to-face -face fight with a massive ore camera in hand. Fuel it up, which is, ugh, god, it's so loud. But because it does burn through so much fuel, we should probably only save this up for real big fights. With that made, I'm really starting to turn this around. I decide to head out and try to rebuild my sugar farm now. Then I decide to even start replanting the forest that night. When I see these little rascals, goblins that use bush camo. And I'm noticing that all of the trees are speaking goblinese. Now, how did I know that these were goblins and not just bushes? Normally bushes don't charge you. That's what really tipped me off. You gotta pay really close attention to this kind of stuff. By day 55, I'm getting the mechanical part of the auto farm pretty set up. I'll skip through most of this because I've already shown this like four times and this is just the same exact style of farm. We turn it on and uh, admittedly, might be the worst farm I've made so far. But remember, these don't need to be fast. It doesn't make the sugarcane grow any quicker. 
Then we head to bed. Now I'm thinking, I can probably get this place looking pretty good in the next few days. And look at this. Some of the sheep even made it through the castle calamity. So maybe I'm not totally alone. Then we're grabbing some more ingredients for andesite, cause you can never have enough. And then we actually find an andesite pocket. I have to admit, it is really weird how much I care about this rock that normally I didn't even notice. We find a deep mine shaft with some diamonds, so that's nice. I find a heart-shaped necklace too, and I'm gonna wear it to remind me of my one true love, you loyal viewer. Now you have to wear your necklace, and if I catch you not wearing it, that means you don't love me and I'll cry. After two days of mining, we get home and we load the processor up. This will be working for a few days and we can go focus on something else. And I decide it's time for some barbecued orc. We're gonna go into the nether and get a blaze burner so that we can make a flamethrower. And of course this place would have its own weird boy. I try to fight this little goblin warlock and dodge the gas with no range weapons. And I managed to try to get away from these little demons. All of this while I'm fighting on soul sand. I gotta admit, it does not go well. I'm gonna be honest, I know you guys know this, but I really, really hate the nether. And I always find it so unsettling, but I do have to give thanks. I just barely got a half a heart back from food in the same tick that I get hit with another arrow. The whole playthrough was one tick away from being over right here. I really, really hate this place. I eat and dig my way to bravely retreat and get my way back to the surface as safely as I can. So on the start of day 58, no flamethrower for me. But that's not the only toy in Create. The iconic Create weapon is the Potato Cannon. Sure, it takes a precision mechanism, but we've done that before and we can do it again. So we do it, we do it, we do, we make it again. We work with the crafters again, we simply get all of the other parts in place, and if I can give you guys an honest piece of advice, if you decide to try out this mod pack, rush this. The potato cannon might be my favorite part of the create mod. I love this goofy little toy. I even make a copper back tank so that I don't use up the durability of the cannon. Turns out you just need to plug it in to a vertical shaft that's spinning. The faster it's spinning, the faster you'll charge this thing up. I then decide just to see how fast I can actually go. I add another large cogwheel, and another, and another, and there, that. See how I can't attach a shaft? That is as fast as you can go. So I do decide to backstep a little bit, and I decide that this is probably fast enough. We then run a shaft all the way down to the processing platform. And at this high spinning speed, it only takes about 10 seconds to fully charge the backpack. One small drawback of the back tank is that it counts as your chest armor. We can do more range damage, but we have less defense. We're setting ourselves up to be a glass cannon, potato cannon. Uh, I really shouldn't be making these puns this close to the next event. And of course, they've built a siege bridge into my base. Also, I've never used the cannon, so I have no idea what I'm doing right now. I, I miss a lot. Okay, I'm kind of starting to land my shots now, and I'm getting a little bit of a feel for the damage. It's not as strong as melee, but it does a good amount of damage and it does knock back, which keeps them away. I take out the first one and I quickly get another. Now, let's see what's actually going on outside. Wow. They've literally built an extension bridge over the front entrance. I thought I was an engineer. Well, they're not too smart because they've made this whole thing really flammable and no one's guarding it right now. I peek my head out a little bit and I see that even though the bridge is really dangerous, the raiding party was actually pretty tame. No big boss boys or weird boys. I made quick work of this little attack, but now I can clearly see that with the castle gone, the orcs can get right up to my front door. They could easily trap me in here for the next event if I'm not smart about what I do next. And what I do next is light myself on fire. See now, the orcs can't kill me if I've already done it myself. Eh? Big brain right there. So it turns out those orcs were really just a scouting party because a bunch more orcs got into the cave over the bridge when I wasn't looking. And these are the savage orcs. But the thing is, now that I have range, I can jump away and I can hit them and knock them off into the depths below, which means they're not as effective if they try to invade into the fortress itself. I do a quick sweep of my base 
and I see that there aren't any left, and I'm thinking we're clear. I even grab some of the loot that they've dropped too. We just need to go outside and clean up what's left and break down the bridge. But not so quick. The big boss has finally showed up now, and these two would normally be pretty scary. But luckily, we were smart enough to break the bridge before we went to bed last night. And with this new potato cannon, this is actually pretty easy. Sadly, I don't know if I'm doing that much damage, so I do need to go up and fight them face to face. I see his health, and sure enough, the cannon just tickles this guy. Soon I fight him back into the pit where the castle was. It's fitting, the hole that they created would be their downfall. We finish breaking down the last bits of the bridge, and I get my potatoes ready, because I know I'm going to be using a lot of them. I make sure to charge up my backpack, and I use the loot we collected from the last fight to make enough orc steel to get our orc hammer. Like I said, I am still going to have to do some fights up close, so I'll need this. And now that I know the orcs can get up into our cave, I'm going to need a better defense. These bars are good for now, but I'm going to have to make sure to really seal this up proper. Speaking of seal up proper, I find this new door design and I really like this. And even though I liked it before I knew it did this, now I really like this. I add them everywhere I can. Then I get back to business and I make a sword out of the orc teeth as well. The hammer is good for bosses and single targets, but the sword should be able to hold off the groups. I even try to enchant it, but I don't have enough XP yet. So I decide to take advantage of all the extra potatoes we're going to have, and I set up a little XP furnace right here. Inspired by my new door setup, I decide to add a few of these brass doors to the very front entrance, and boy do they look ugly. I love these doors, but this right here, this ain't it, chief. I get some stone to go around, and at least it kind of like makes sense now, but still, eh. This front entrance right here, it needs some love. This could be my primary priority from now on. I learned something right here. I accidentally start shooting the baked potatoes, but it turns out baked potatoes cause fire damage. I even try it with the zombie with the helmet on to make sure that they weren't just burning up in the sun. And yeah, turns out baked potatoes also have a flamethrower perk. This thing just keeps getting better. This means we no longer need to have a stack of raw potatoes. We can go ahead and bake them tates. Combined with the ash bricks means that I'm getting a pretty reliable source of XP too. But I'm not done seeing how awesome these new weapons are. Down on the cave floor, I'm trying out the new hammer and... If you jump up and you crit with the hammer, you can cause an AoE explosion. I, I think with my whole setup, I might be a god now? But I can't focus too much on my offense. I still need a good amount of defense, so I begin the process of making a proper front entrance. I craft up a bunch of radial chassis and two mechanical bearings. I'm also going to need a new block, a sequenced gear shift, which is just a casing, a cog, and an electron tube. Let's start to make this bad boy. I start by digging two blocks down and putting the gear shifts, then the mechanical bearings on top of that. Then we add all of the radial chassis on the surface on both sides of the cave. And if you haven't figured it out yet, what we're doing is we're making two huge multi-block doors and we're using these as the hinges. We're gonna have to clear out some space so that they can swing open. Speaking of space, there's a ton of space to just walk right in my base from the side. All right, we're definitely gonna have to fix this. But on the upside, I can use this open little space right here and I can set up a water wheel. We just need some cogs and shafts and set this whole system up to go down to the gearboxes at the bottom of the door hinge. I think in total, that means that these shafts are running a full three blocks deep, but I'm not really sure. We then run a shaft all the way across, connecting the gearboxes, and then we set up all the cog, blah, blah, blah. You guys already know what I'm doing. You brilliant viewers. Seriously though, come to think of it, my audience is probably some of the smartest Minecraft viewers there are. We do do some pretty complex tech mods. Of course, we're not as cool as those 100 days as Spider-Man. Ooh. We then add some water from the top. This isn't necessary, of course. I just like the look of an indoor waterfall. Next, we're going to have to craft up a new block, a redstone link. And I think we need four of these. We then place these on top of the sequenced gearboxes, just below those mechanical bearings. We add in a block. Any block will do. In our case, we're going to be using stone. Then we simply have to shift click with bare hands and make this a receiving link. Finally, we set up one more link wherever we want the button to be. Then we just have to match the same blocks, stone, as the receiving links. Then just add a button to the block that has the link. Now that the hard part's done, 
We just need to build up the doors. Hard brass casings with some solid brass blocks down the middle look pretty good. We then shift mouse click here to set the whole row of chassis to only open one side of the door. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'm dumb. Because once again, I totally forgot to super glue the doors to the chassis. Come on now, if I actually did this right on the first try, would it even be the Captain CV? Luckily, this is a super quick fix. We put out some glue, put everything together again, and finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'm even dumber than before. <laughs> Look at this. Wow, this is a total disaster. The hinges were also attached to the walls by default, and they rip half of the mountain out as they turn. Okay, so we're gonna have to spend some time and repair the huge chunks that got ripped up here. Uh, but the real problem here is that now we have to try to figure out how to stop this from happening again. So, I set up the sequence gear shift to set 90 degrees, then hold for 10 seconds, then turn 90 degrees the other way so that they'll shut. Then, the inverse on the other side, obviously, so that at least they will swing open correctly this time. Okay, great. That's one problem solved, I guess. As for that whole minor ripping the entire wall open thing, you just need to make sure that when the wall fully opens, it's also not touching any blocks. So on the inside of our cave, we have to move the walls one block back. So in order to do this, sadly, we're gonna have to move the water wheel back, but that's not too bad. Then on the other side, we just need to shave the wall a little bit. So finally, Ladies and gentlemen, am I a triple dumb? Finally, we get this thing to work properly. Now, as you can see, as long as we have this little space here on the side of the doors, when they're open, it will not hold onto the blocks as it swings closed again. And I gotta admit, when this thing closed up properly, I was pretty relieved, but also I was kind of proud. I toyed and I tweaked with this until I finally got it to work. And now we have exactly what we wanted and we have no compromises. A sealed front entrance with massive swinging doors that open into the fortress halls, automatically being closed behind us. I do decide to add in some brick to make the hallway look more like a hallway and less of just a cave. This is next level, and honestly, this door right here, it's kind of the highlight of my base so far. I love this doorway, which is not only a great answer to these aggressive orc attacks, but also it looks impressive, and it shows off our engineering prowess. And then finally, I learn about XP Nuggets. Turns out they are meant to be eaten. Mickey D's had it right all along. Their Create Mods way of giving you back the experience that you would lose from mining with Silk Touch. You'll actually get more of it in the end if you process all of your ores. So with this big injection of XP and a little extra XP from the furnace setups, I go on an enchanting spree and get my gear looking much stronger. I even see that I can get power five on my cannon. Uh, yeah, pretty sure we're gonna do that. And finally, by the end of the day, we get the fortress entrance hallway looking pretty good. I gotta say, when this thing swings open, it looks great. I'm so happy with this, I almost forgot all about the orcs. So of course that night, they remind me. Now the fort might be pretty secure, but whenever I actually head out of the front door, the orcs come out a goblin. And while at first I thought these were just little minions, I get a glimpse of the weird orc again. He's casting a ton of wither spells at me. He even managed to make a copy of himself. He's getting more and more powerful, and this is really getting out of hand. Every time I get a little bit more powerful, the orcs simply outdo me again and again. They're always one step ahead of me. And as I shoot them, I think they might even be fire resistant now too. This is getting a little too dangerous. Plus it's nighttime, there's other mobs out. Yeah, time to get out of here. On day 67, I decide that even with my improved gear, I should probably try to get more defense. And I start making, well, a fence. Now I'll admit, at first this wall of iron crossbars might look silly because like, what's the point? I already have a giant door. This is just going to block me out. This is just a setup for our next project. We make a rope pulley. Now the rope pulley needs rope and the rope needs hemp. So first, we set up all the chassis on top of the iron bars that are at the very top of the doorway. It looks like just before day 69, we're going to be 420 blazing as we go to score some hemp. Next, we add some super glue to all the chassis so that they'll grab the iron bars. Then we head to the very top of the mountainside. Yep, here is where we're gonna set up the pulley directly over the chassis below, and then we add another sequence gear shift. We add a powered toggle latch. 
Take notes, there will be a test at the end. Next to that, we add yet another redstone link. This time, we add a different block than the front door. So we're gonna do copper shingles this time. And now for the fun part, we need to power this thing in. I don't wanna make a windmill or another water wheel up here. So I need to make a pathway through the mountain and run a shaft all the way from the bottom water wheel. These doors and these pulleys, they don't really take too much stress. So this one water wheel still has a ton of stress units. I just need to get some shafts heading up the right way. I use this vertical gearbox here then I run down and make another vertical gearbox here. And finally, see how it's going down? That's how you know it's working. The pulley starts to drop down and it will automatically attach to the gate below it. We then set down another receiver down on the front. And this time it'll have the matching block, copper shingles. Did you remember that? Then once we press this, it, uh, well, that's not exactly what I was thinking, but hey, it's got the spirit. All we really need to do is pretty much set up a block where the gate will stop and sit upon and then clean up the sides so that it looks a little bit better. And there it is. I mean, yeah, that's that's exactly what I was looking for. It's just, I don't know. What do you guys think? Maddie, it's just not looking right. By day 68, I had a copper outlining the whole way up so that it's looking a lot more solid, but now it just looks so boxy. So now we can get this gate with iron bars to raise and lower and we can get the front doors to swing open and automatically shut. I mean, it looks great, don't get me wrong, but it's just missing some, some life, some spice, you know, some pizzazz. You know what? I got an idea. There once was a great castle here, and while I'll never be able to replace it, I can at least honor it. I'm gonna make this whole gatehouse look proper with two matching castle towers on each side, two massive shafts, for all the ladies to see. So finally, by the end of day 69, I can officially proudly say I'm wearing some protection to cover my shaft and my hole. All right, looks like we get to test these defenses out. Of course, the second I open the door, they come rushing in. But the intelligence level of these orcs is, uh, well, if they take any damage, they simply run away. They try to do hit and run, and I guess in this case, that means they run into this nether portal, so we at least get away with that one. Being trapped in here with a big boss could have been bad. I heal myself, and I steal myself for the next attack, and I kite my way back down through the hall. I crit with my hammer, and one's dead, and the other is stunned, and the second group leader goes down. Now, I clear out the hallway again, and I start to heal. Turns out the gate and the doorway combination only lets in a few at a time, which I can fight, so their big numbers are neutralized. Perfect. But it looks like the first attack wave is down. But, whoa. They've built an entire fortress right at my front door? Ooh, this feels a lot like a trap. I head to the nether, where I find those first two orcs that ran. This is a tough little fight here, and they're getting some good hits in without any of my defenses. But with all the enchants I've added, I'm holding up pretty well. The main strategy here is I just try to keep them far away and blast them with taters, and it's working. Then if they get close, a couple quick hits with my hammer, and I can juggle the big boss and take him down. Now we go on to the fortress, because this is the real reason I came here in the first place. I make a quicker little path to the fortress. I'm trying to find those blazes. The reason I want those blazes is because I need that flamethrower to quickly set the entire orc camp on fire. Now that there's an orc camp in my front yard, it's time. On day 71, the next wave arrives. Turns out, if you leave the camps, they're gonna keep on spawning. So we really need to do, and my door has locked me out. And what might be worse is that the controls are inside of the orc camp. Now they might not be smart enough to use the buttons, but they are smart enough to block me from using them. I clear out a pack of orc, make a mad dash for the controls, and I jump back inside as quickly as I can. Whew, that was too close. Now, I recharge and reload my cannon, and I get ready for another push. This time, with a little more firepower. Get it? Firepower? It's no time for puns. The flamethrower simply needs some coal and a little good aim. Now, my door is made out of casing, so it shouldn't be flammable, but uh, yeah, I don't want to test it out now. I make sure not to get locked outside again, and I start firing this thing off. No pun intended. Okay, okay, stay focused. The flames don't light the orcs themselves on fire directly, but it can light the ground on fire. 
So, by lighting the ground underneath them, they start to burn and scatter. This, combined with the cannon, adding fire damage itself, and, well, them being dumb orcs, means that even though there's an army of them out here, I'm putting out a lot of damage. Seriously, look at this, though. There's so many of them. This is taking forever. It's taking so long that eventually I let my guard down just enough and get pushed outside again. But this time, I have a flamethrower. I get a little burning madness going here. Ooh, gotta slow down a little bit. In general, I'm still pretty safe with this whole setup. I stay up all night fighting these boys, making sure to push them back if they get too close. But with no weird orcs or any kind of range, they really have no chance here. Slowly, the sound of orc starts to fade. Soon, there's a little bit of a chance, and I take it. I run through the flames, and I get to the controls. But I'm actually feeling pretty safe, so I keep pushing my attack. I can see the big boss and his first mate coordinating the attack from the main hall, and I light it on fire with them inside. I gotta say, I love this birdie boy. <clears throat> I mean, flamethrower. I charge in with one last attack, and I kill the mini boss. And with that, the castle has held firm. And at the sunrise of the next day, I find myself once again tearing down an orc camp. I still need to be careful. There are stragglers running around though. I may have killed off a lot of orc, but they've also killed off all my frames. So laggy. The orc wood is also super tough, and I think it might be fire resistant too. As a reward for my victory, I have enough XP to upgrade my cannon with power five, bringing the damage from five to nine. And hey, as a bonus, we get punch too. So I decide it's time to get even more power and put it in a hammer with fire aspect two and bane of arthropods, boo. On day 73, I make another orc teeth sword. After that fight, I have plenty of teeth and I even get some XP. I wanna to try to power up my flamethrower or maybe even the new sword. But first, we need to get another precision mechanism. Now I could show you the whole process, but let's be honest, we all know I'm gonna nail it. Oh, wow, I actually, I actually did get it right. Hmm. We set up the mechanical crafters to be in the shape of, well, a giant pair of pants. Then we shove the mechanism right in the uh, belt area. What we're doing here is we're making a pair of pants that if you were to see me from behind, it would really show off my engineering skills. Because this pair of pants can make you jump two blocks instead of one and doubles your speed. If they are fueled, of course. I gotta say, fully geared up, I'm looking pretty good right now. I love how Create makes some really great gear. It's balanced and it's hard enough to acquire all this, but it's worth it if you put the work in. I end the day by collecting some calcite. So by day 75, I can use the sawmill setup to make some calcite cut blocks. See, I told you the setup would come in handy later. Well, I don't lie. The upside is that this makes a ton of really cool blocks to build with. The downside is you don't get to choose which blocks come out. No problem, I'll make do. For now, let's try to add on one more layer of defense. Call it overkill if you want, but last event, the orcs were a little too close for comfort. I wanna keep them a bit further away. And what better way to do that than to make a drawbridge? That's right, we're doing a triple defense. Now the drawbridge should be pretty easy. It should be pretty much like the doorways, only horizontal. And this cog system is already set up right here, with the water wheel still having plenty of stress to make this whole thing work. This time, I remember the glue. Finally, I'm actually learning. And soon, it looks great. I just need to make sure that I adjust the chassis so that they bring down only the bridge and not the entire tower itself. We then set this link to use some blossom planks, and then we add the receiving link as well. And boom, the bridge comes crashing down. What a welcome. We lower the bridge, raise the gate, and we open the door. A true fortress indeed. But I do notice one big problem. The gate and the drawbridge are on the same axis. This means that the gate can no longer be lowered. And that would kind of be a waste. And this drawbridge was pretty easy to set up. So on day 77, I just moved the whole drawbridge one block out. It still looks pretty good, so I'm happy. I then use some ash bricks to make a big staircase that will go up to the bridge when it's extended. I then give it a test and I try to walk in and then I take a look at how it looks when I walk out. This is so cool, you guys. 
This right here is the real reason you should give CreateMod a try. This is an iconic kind of create machine. And to be honest, it's pretty simple. Uh, oh, oh, okay. It's a little bit of a mistake. So if you drop the drawbridge while the gate is down, well, it pulls the bridge, gate, and the doors right out of their hinges. Oof. I just have to lower the top part of the gate. Then it connects to everything, pulls the gate out of the middle, and then everything is working the way it should. That night, I even decide to add a small platform to keep all my buttons nice and neat. Then, of course, what drawbridge system is complete without a little bit of lava? I have no idea how orcs deal with liquids or lava, so I guess we're gonna find out. I have to make a quick couple of trips to the nether to get buckets full, and soon, we have a little mini Bowser's castle going on. Now I only have about 20 days left, and I'm feeling like, honestly, the orcs don't have a chance. In fact, with such a solid defense, I can't even think of a real reason to go and fight them anymore. I'm going to be focused on getting these decorative stones. I spent some time mining and trying to find them. My favorite color is green, but I mean, I'm the captain, so I should probably try to get blue, right? However, I am rudely reminded that I still need to put up some kind of fight when I run across this golem wannabe. He gets me pretty low pretty fast and I need to back off. I thought I was done fighting in this playthrough. And just when I get down to half a heart, I get ambushed by a weird boy, of course. Okay, I might just have to come out of retirement to kill that guy. But once again, I get very distracted by, oh boy, Viridium, a rich, deep green block that I really, really want. Fill up my inventory with as much as I can handle. I start to head back to the surface. I come across some Akram, which is cool, but eh, it's all brown. Kind of looks like Dookie Rock. Nah, I'm good. Let's just keep going. I then pop out right next to the orc camp, and I almost pee myself. Okay, time to get out of here. They do send a little mini hunting party out, but uh, I guess all the big boys are asleep. I drop off all the ores, and then I get the viridium in the sawmill. But the sun is rising on day 80. I hope my faith in my defenses is well founded. So, I check out front, and nothing. With my super defenses, it looks like they didn't even try today. No damage to my farms, no forest on fire. It's quiet, too quiet. My potato farm has stopped, but I think that's just because it's overflowed, and that's not too scary. In fact, it's kind of soothing to just sit back and watch this thing cut down all of the fully grown potatoes. Then, we get to load up the smoker chest, and it looks like there's hardly an orc event at all. Hmm, this is not like them. It's kind of unnerving. Let's just be sure and go check on what these ugly boys are doing. Well, looks like I was right to be suspicious. They've built an entire second camp that's even bigger than the first. If I leave them alone, they just continue to expand. This is not good, but they really weren't able to attack. Maybe they still can't get through my defenses no matter how much they expand. So I get started on my very last project of these 100 days by clearing out a huge area underground. On day 81, I start to collect the needed components. I start out by crafting up a control rail, a plow, some normal rails, a deployer, and finally, a lot of mechanical drills and linear chassis. Then we get a cart assembler and we head down to the construction site. First, you need to set down the controller rail with the cart assembler on top of that. Now, on top of this, we can attach the linear chassis. And the order and number of these isn't really what's important. I mean, the more the merrier, of course. But let's just stay small and just test out to see if we can get this thing working first. Then, you glue a total of four linear chassis all in a line in front of the whole thing. And at the bottom of that, glue on the deployer facing backwards. Then, on the front of the wall of chassis, glue the drills so they're facing forward, and at this point, you can probably see what this project is going to be. On the back side, add four glued chassis in a line, just like you did on the front, and put one more chassis on the bottom, just like the last one. Looking good so far. Now, glue a plow facing inward at the back of the whole thing, and just add some chests on the back of the drills to hold all of the loot we're going to get. Then, we add the cart, we need to clear out a path for the very nose of this thing with the deployer. This path must be clear and also have a block underneath it. And then, nope, 
Oh, I mean, yep. Oh, I mean, I mean, nope. So it turns out I put the deployer on wrong. See, the deployer has to be facing back, but also has to have the palm facing down, uh, if that makes any sense. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, the achievement is much more promising there. And if you guys couldn't tell, this is an automated drill. No fuel or power needed. It goes endlessly as long as it has a clear track and it could be totally customized. To be honest, this is the real highlight of this video. This thing can literally mine thousands of blocks for you. And it only took me like a day to make. It's really that easy to set up. This right here is where Create outshines almost every other tech-based mod. Immersive engineering may have an excavator and Buildcraft might have the quarry, but this thing can be built into whatever you want. It's automated and it takes no fuel and it can be built pretty early into the game. Building this combines old school Minecraft fun with new levels of creative uses. It kind of combines the fun of being a child and exploring new ideas with your imagination, but it uses the ingenuity and creative thinking of being an adult coming back to Minecraft. This turns what would normally be a too tall strip mining tunnel into a massive cave. And this is still just a baby version of the auto miner. You might even say it's a minor miner. Oh, I couldn't stop with that one. Okay, I'm sorry. So of course, now that I'm in love with this thing, on day 83, I start to crank this into overdrive. I head down the huge tunnel we've made and I start to add on even more linear chassis and on those, I add all the drills. And all of this just takes one cart, no power or anything else needed. I finish up adding everything on and fire this bad boy up and look at this. It's so powerful. It's honestly kind of scary. It just pushes through a huge amount of rock. In a weird way, it's basically creating an entire horizontal ravine. I can just mine whatever the machine doesn't directly pick up on the sides. Imagine how powerful this thing is gonna be when we set it down on a diamond level. It could slice through hundreds of blocks of deep slate in minutes. I'm just barely below the surface. In fact, we actually pop out in a lavender field, which is kind of fitting if you think about it, because in a lavender field is where we started these 100 days. I decide it's time to turn around and head home. I stop it and I disassemble it. I decide instead of making a whole new too tall strip mining path, I'm just gonna go back through the path that we've already made. I set down the assembler and then I add the linear chassis. Only this time, I put them all over on the right side since the left side has already been mined out. Now, let's see if I can speed run setting this whole thing up. After all, this is the only real part that kind of drags you down. You need to change directions manually and reset this thing up each time. Luckily, by using such a simple design, this thing can be picked up and put down in just a few minutes. Even one that's this big with this many drills. <laughs> hey look, this one even has a little bit of lavender on it. Hmm. Soon, this thing is slicing its way back to the fortress and making a huge cave the whole way through. All I need to do is make sure that there's a laid out path for the rails. And I can pretty much just relax. Or so I thought. Turns out, the weird orc has figured out our plan. Honestly, I just want to mine in peace, but these orcs keep on bugging me. I managed to fight off this little rage, but still, I did manage to kill the weird boy. And once again, he pulls back. Just then, I realize why they're being so aggressive. I'm right under their camp. I can actually hear them playing music above me. <laughs> but you know what? That's fine. I'll just go dig somewhere else. So I start the digger back up and we get right out of here as fast as we can. I don't want any more orc trouble anyways. Besides, I have a ton of decorative blocks coming now. I start to add my green verdium and start to make some of the pillars on the walls white calcite. And by that night, I get a little sample of how the colors are gonna work together and how a stone fortress might look. Much better than a wooden fortress for sure. The next day, I go down in the tunnel to check out the drill to see if we're out of orc territory. And just then, I hear it. There's no denying it. That's the sound of a villager. It's right under the orcs camp. Are the orcs holding villagers hostage? Is that the secret that the orcs were trying to defend and keep me from digging up? Back at base, I start to think of a plan. Now, at this point, I'm continuing to improve the living conditions of my fortress. But this time, I'm doing it because I might have some new friends coming in. Or should I say old friends? Could all of my villager friends still be alive, hidden in the orc camps? I think about it all day, 
and I start to let myself have hope. Maybe I misheard that. Maybe that was just a traveling merchant? No, they have different sounds, right? <laughs> Maybe it was just me being desperate and hearing what I want to hear. Besides, even if those were villagers, even if they were still alive, how would I even... Oh, wait. Time to grab as much andesite as we can. I know exactly what I need to do. As I poke my head out and come back to the surface, I find a small raid of pillagers coming to the front of the fortress. I don't know if these clowns are part of the event on day 90 or if the orcs are holding back and preparing for day 100, but I really don't care. I swipe them aside because I've definitely dealt with worse. I drop the andesite off at my base and then I head out for that night. I find the mine that I dug before and I carefully head back down. I'm down here to grab some green for Diem, but I've come here for so much more this time. I keep exploring deeper into the caves, swimming in underground lakes, and then I find it. The real thing that I've been looking for for days now, Azarine, the deep blue rock, the true stone of the captain. Now first, I have to dig directly up. I mark this mine so that I know exactly where it is. We head back home, but instead of being attacked by orgs, it looks like we're fighting lag, and we're losing. Like seriously, I think we might be down to five frames here. Man, I need a new computer. Okay, we drop off all the viridium into the sawmill and all of the ores into the processor. We head back to the marker that we made. I then spend an entire day filling my pockets with azurine. Finally, we make our way back home, and I start cutting up the azurine first thing. The good news is, the whole time I was gone, the sawmill was making a ton of these beautiful decorative blocks. So after I do a quick little repair on my kit, I start to really set out all of these new decorative blocks. I even start to get a few of our new blue blocks into the mix, but I'm really going to have to wait for the sawmill to do its thing first. Finally, by day 93, I've decided I want to have a blue azurine floor all throughout the central platform of the fortress. The green will be the borders and the accents, with the calcite white being my support beams and columns. I actually do decide to replace the copper archways with the calcite because it's starting to oxide and it's starting to turn teal. That looks great for some ruins or some old buildings, but this fortress right here will be a ruin over my dead body. Oh, no, no, hold on. What I mean when I say that is, I, I mean I don't want that to come true. Like, I, I'm not trying to foreshadow anything. Anyway, forget that I said that. Moving on. I start to remove some of the wooden planks and I start to replace them all with platforms made out of our stone. Down on this lower ledge, I make a really cool blue pattern with white borders. And by day 95, I have a proper staircase going throughout the middle of the fortress. I keep going through the base and I replace most of the wooden supports with different white columns. The basic style I'm going with is that there's blue bricks with some smooth green looking borders that are really stunning and highlight the rest of the blocks. Now, the entire fortress looks like it was carved out of precious gems from the heart of the mountain itself. Finally, that night, we head to the enchantment room and I start to rebuild it, tearing out all of the wood and replacing it with a ton of azurine stone. On day 96, I check out my work and I gotta admit, I'm more than just happy with it. It's turning out looking perfectly. And with how the rest of the Dwarven Fortress has turned out, this might be one of the best mods I've ever played, and one of the best 100 days we've ever done. I do think I'll keep this highest part up here with the windmills on top, logs, and planks because the blossom wood still does look pretty good. As I go around my base and take a look at my finished work, you're probably wondering, why am I working so hard to make this place look nice? What was that big idea that I had on day 98? How is this video going to end? What happens to the orcs? What about those villagers? And there's a good reason why I'm making this fortress so solid and look so good. Trust me. With only three days left, I have to hurry. I quickly start to rip out all the walls of my old living area. This humble little cave right here has been completely denied since the earliest days of this 100 day playthrough and I think it's about time we get it looking right. So this fortress will be more than just a base more than just a mining warehouse, more than just a steampunk industrial factory. Now, we're living in a proper dwarven palace. A place that isn't just good to work in, but would be something anyone would be proud to live in. 
because soon there will be many more of us coming to live here. Yep, that's right. In just two days, we are not only going to destroy the orcs, but we're going to save the villagers and bring them home. At the start of day 99, I take a quick moment to scout out our target. But I'm not simply going to run in there headlong. After all, what am I? An orc? I spend all night hard at work. I'm making as many linear chassis and drills as I can. My goal is to get to two stacks of each, but it's already day 100. It's time to use the create mod to destroy. I dig upwards from our massive tunnel to find an area just in front of the orc camp. I set down the control rail, and that's right, we are gonna set up the auto drill. But we aren't drilling for diamonds here, we're drilling for blood. I start to get the main body in place, but I'm a little bit rushed here. Being this close to the orc camp, it's pretty intense. I break up to the surface, and I quickly start to get the linear chassis all set up. Now we still haven't managed to get any of the orcs' attention yet. They really aren't known for their intelligence after all. The night falls, and now we have the cover of darkness to finish this. Looks like you guys are getting a bonus day now, because we're going to strike at sunrise on day 101. I start to dig the lead path when... There, I hear them. The villagers. They are still alive. I carefully look around till I find some cobblestone. I drill my way up and I see them. I have to move quickly. I don't know how much longer till the orcs figure out what we're getting up to. I start to break them out and slowly set them free. I quickly craft up some boats and I start to get them in so that I can push them out. But uh, yeah, getting villagers into boats, this might be the hardest part of the entire raid. Finally, they're in the boats and I start to dig out the tunnel so that I can get them all the way back. I'm gonna set them here in the staging area. They'll be safe here while I take care of some unfinished business. Finally, we start up the war machine. It roars to life and it starts to shoot towards the enemy camp. But soon, the orcs manage to stop it. I think that they're actually able to body block it if they get in the way of the minecart. So I'm gonna have to fight them and get them all out of the way, which is easier said than done. It turns out I do in fact see a huge group of big boss orcs trying to hold the drill back. I start blasting away and give them a little taste of the taters like I do. But seriously, it seems like the more I shoot, the more start pouring out. I've been killing a ton of them, but my backpack is starting to run low on charge. Then I see the wither spell is being cast. That means he's here. This is gonna be our last fight. I hide in this trench, and I even manage to block in a pack of the melee orcs. And it was a good thing I did this too, because my backpack is just about to go critical. I use my last few shots on these orcs, but they're still coming. I'm trying to bury the trapped orcs alive with gravel, but the weirdo comes in and stops me before I can. Now I'm trying to restart the war machine. Good news is I've cleared out enough of the orcs. The bad news is the weird orc has me pinned. I do manage to get the drills running again, and I get back up to the surface just in time to see... Ugh, isn't it glorious? The drills are shredding through the orc camp like butter. I've been waiting more than a hundred days to see this. Now the orcs know what it's like to have their home destroyed. There's a huge slice in the map that has been completely leveled. The orc camp is literally split right down the middle. And what's better yet is that the orc's own hut has been ripped open. I can even see the prison where the villagers are being held. These cages will never hold any more innocent villagers ever again. I start to light up the last scraps of the camp, because we're leaving nothing but ashes. Now, the orcs are all dead or trapped, and the villagers have been saved. The camp has been flattened. Only one last score to settle. I might have started this 100 days thinking we could live and let live. I thought we should try to forgive and forget the bullies and their attacks on our friends. But this only emboldened them to continue. The orcs might have started this, but today we are gonna finish it. Early on the morning of day, I don't even know what day it is anymore. All I know is I'm finding that weird boy. I'm hunting orc. We throw on our fully fueled exo gear. This starts to draw all the orcs out in the open. Now I can start to use the orc weapons against them, but they aren't going down so easily. 
the Weird Boy has boosted their speed. I mean, look at this guy. Talk about zoomies. And I need to mega jump and blast them from way up here just to live. The very last big boss chases me, but I still have just enough cannon strength to finish him. Now, where is that Weird Boy? Got him. I fire a shot at him, then he fires a missile right back. A few more minions come in, but honestly, I can't even be worried about them. I blast them away, then I rush in and get a crit on the weird boy with my warhammer. I do a huge amount of damage, but I take a hit myself, and I'm down to one heart, and I run for my life. I don't care if we survived 100 days, I'm not going to die right now. This missile will kill me if it hits me. I just have to keep on running and try to find a way to put some distance between me and it. I need to eat and get enough health so I can tank the hit. But I have to be quick. I have to get back and start the attack before the weird boy can teleport out again. When I see him, I start blasting with our potato cannons until I see he's dying. I rush in to finish him just in case, but it's already over. He's, he's dead. He even drops the minions, which is a sign that he really has died. And I clean them up pretty quickly. And with that, the orcs, they're gone. All that remains is me, the villagers, and of course you. And I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. <laughs>